second all all, just, I guess. Okay. Hello, class. Let's get started. Welcome. Those of you who don't know, Sam's shirts, if you were to female size, okay. a couple of those that came separately. So those are those. Um, okay. So today, we're just going to review filtering, like we talked about last time. You guys have implemented that in the last few lectures slash labs when I was out. So I'm just going to go over the actual lecture content, make sure you're solid on kind of some of the background and theory. We're going to do steering control, and that's it. That's the end of this class in terms of content. Um, so I have some like announcements to talk through. The first is, in the beginning of the class, we talked about VS Code and PuTTY as a way to run your terminal and to execute commands. Who uses VS Code? Who uses PuTTY? Turns out, PuTTY is better. VS Code, for some reason, is sometimes slows your loop rate down. And we, that, we can't figure that out or know why that occurs. So, but we notice if you use PuTTY, it doesn't happen. So PuTTY is extremely easy to use. You just download it, it's an EXE. All the information is contained in those lecture slides. I can send out maybe a link to the download, but it'll be better. Your performance will be better if everyone uses PuTTY. So thing one. Thing two, homework five, due on the seventh. That's the last lab next week. Um, I think we'll keep that, we'll kind of keep it on the seventh. So you'll end up having homework due on the seventh, competition on the eighth. I'm not opposed to like pushing the homework back if you want. Like I does it, it's probably okay. It's kind of up to you guys. The report is gonna be due on the final day the final is. So you're gonna have some time to do the report. I'll post all the information about it, but you have about three weeks. Yeah. Wait, is there a final or you're just saying it's due on the day of the final? There's no yeah, no final. It would just be that's when the report is due. Since you haven't, since I haven't posted that information, I didn't want that to be due so soon. So so that's post that, submit the report then. Um, this is our like last content lecture. Pretty cool. <clears throat> Next week, all we're going to do on Tuesday, so Tuesday will be class in the lab room. It's just prep, so work on the things that we're talking about, we're talking about today, anything else you want to implement. Same thing for Wednesday. Thursday, we're going to do the competition. I'll talk about that next slide. Any questions on announcement stuff? Okay. Competition. So this is the last lecture, so one week for today. We won't be in here. We'll be in the FRB atrium. We're going to have a competition that's going to take the entire class. And it's going to go through four tasks. And those tasks are kind of going to grade you on the different skills that you've been learning and installing onto your ball bots. Um, so main goal, we want to see like how well does your system work? How well can it balance? How well can it spin? How well can it steer? And then when class starts, so try to, when class starts, be in the atrium with your ball bot, charged and on and connected. And then we'll go from there. So that's going to be how we start that off. And then we will compete as well. So, so we'll be 11 teams, that's you guys, and then, our, then us. So we have the same system that you guys have, we'll be tuning it with the same controllers. If we win, it's fine. If you beat us, then whatever team beats us gets an automatic A in the project. Cool. So the way that we will score, the way this will work, there's going to be four tasks. The first task is just 10 minutes of like raw balancing. So this is a last ball bot standing. If you, you'll get points based on how long you last. If you last all 10 minutes, you get maximum amount of points. The next one is gonna be a, like a kind of a two axis, or a two minute or one minute maximum vertical axis velocity test. So this will be, you have to you know, start your ball bot, we'll start the timer, you have two minutes to get it up to whatever you think is its maximum velocity, Z axis velocity. If it topples, you're DQ'd from that event. So it can't topple, it just spins. So you'll have two minutes to do that. And we'll analyze your data. So you'll be saving your rotation data. And we'll ask you to find your maximum value. And then we'll put that in. We're gonna create like a leaderboard of some kind to track this. But you'll be scored on your maximum angular velocity. Question? Uh, you answered it. Okay. So that's second task. So this will be, so this we all do together. 10 minutes, it will be like a sea of ball bots balancing. Two minute maximum angular velocity, we'll all do that together. So that'll be like everybody starts, we run it for two minutes, and we take like five minutes to look at those data and plug in our numbers in. And then we'll have a two minute uh, balancing test. 
so this will be ball bot, like team, one team at a time. And what we're trying to make is like a system that you put on the ground, like a false floor that can vibrate. And so your goal will be to have your, however can kind of last the longest on a perturbed floor. So that's kind of a disturbance rejection task. Does that make sense? And the last one will be steering around a four foot square. And so however many sides you get to, that's how many, that will let go and how many points you get. Yeah. Are all events weighted equally? Or yeah. is there, okay. Currently, I mean like, this is entirely up for discussion. <laughs> but right now I would say, yeah, there. because this, what this does is, it has kind of two balancing tasks. I'd say that was a focus for a decent amount of the class. It has an angular velocity test, that was a focus. And then steering, that's what we're gonna do today. And that is something that you guys can implement, but it'll be a reach. Probably this is going to be really this is really hard. In fact, I didn't actually think we this would be possible, but we have we have it working. So if we have it working, you guys are supposed to have it. We're trying to get working. <laughs> yeah. When driving on the square, if you go like past, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just nominally a square. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how we will be graded for this? So like information on that. You mean like how it goes into your letter grade? Yeah. Does it uh, does that matter at all? That? I'm not sure. Okay. But generally, I think you should think. As long as you, I mean, if you can compete in these, like if you can do these, if you can compete in them, even if you're not winning, like that's what we want. You don't have to okay. win to get to be doing well in the class. If your if your system can actually do this, that's what we want. Cool. For those of you who just walked in. For those of you who just walked in. Four events for the competition, one week for today. 10 minutes balancing, last ball about standing in a sense. Two minutes to get to your maximum angular velocity without toppling over. Two minutes to balance on a floor that shakes. And four minutes, approximately four minutes of steering. So this one, these guys will do, will do all together. This will do one at a time, and we'll watch, we kind of watch and cheer. Each team's ball about. And then this will probably be two teams at a time. So I'm off to the side of the square. So this will probably take the, I'm going to take the entire class period. Any questions? Competition? Also, like this is last, those of you who walked in, last content lecture. We have we have class next week on Tuesday and lab on Wednesday, where we'll, all we'll do is work on our ball lots and prep for this. Okay. Cool. All right. We're going to review filtering, then we're going to get to steering control. Filtering. I think, like, without, I didn't see the last <coughs> class on Tuesday and lab yesterday. And I understand that, that way you guys were kind of learning and implementing filtering um, in, in Python. So what I want to know, or at least got, helped me understand, is how well you guys were tracking the filtering parts. So this is, again, the, kind of like a deeper dive. But if you guys already know this, feel free to let me know, or we can go, go more quickly. Filtering is a huge part of building robots. We use it to filter out all sorts of things, usually unwanted noise, uncertainty that comes from different things. Um, in our ball bot, where, where do you guys see noise coming from? Can you look at your, your data, your signals? On your ball bot, have you guys looked at it? Have you guys implemented filters? Why did you implement filters? Yeah. You see noise in the IMU. Where did that noise come from? Maybe from like vibrations and the. Definitely. Yeah, the, it vibrates when it rolls. The wheels are very unsmooth. You see, you're going to see a lot of vibration. Do you care about that vibration? Not really. No. So that's why we, when you're building your robot, you'll be seeing parts of your signals you care about and parts that you don't. This falls squarely into things we don't care about. We want to get that out of there, so we filter it. Um, so we pass signals through a filter. Low-pass filters are going to kind of smooth and shift. OK. We talked about this tool called the Fourier transform. You guys, who's familiar or feels good with Fourier transforms? Probably from other classes. OK, who thinks of it as like something they're very uncomfortable with? Okay, well, you're, this class is not going to make you comfortable in it, but what you should know is it is an analysis that someone made up. 
And that analysis converts <coughs> signals from the time domain, what they look like, to the frequencies that make up that signal. And it is a math operation that looks like this. But the exact sort of mathematics behind it, I think, are not certainly not critical for this class. But know that it's a tool that breaks signals into frequencies. Do all signals, are all signals made up of frequencies? What do you think? Yeah, all signals are, everything's made up of frequencies. It's just a different lens to look at something that's happening. Um, what about a signal that's not infinite time? Does it, does the, how does time factor in? Does it make a difference if I look at the signals in a, in a the frequencies in a signal that's one second versus 100 seconds? Because would that affect the analysis? The answer is no. What it's going to do is it has two effects. If you have a, if you're looking at the frequency content in a signal. It's going to tell you the frequency content of that entire length of time that you run this analysis on. So if you do it for one second, it's going to give you the frequency in that one second. If you do it for a minute, it's going to give you frequencies in that one minute. It does change what it will output because it can no longer provide information on frequencies that would be longer than that length of time. So the lowest frequency you can measure is one over your width. But I think the easiest way I think to think about it is in terms of like audio examples. Think of it in terms of audio signals that you can hear. This is what's going on in that transform. There is so much usefulness in this figure, but it's a little bit mind-bending. What you guys see that we're looking at here, we're looking at three people whistling into a microphone. This is what the time it took you to record that voltage from that microphone. It's going to look like this, which has some, it's a time domain signal. You can tell there's some frequency information in there, but it would be difficult to figure that out just by looking at the time domain signal. But if we perform that Fourier transform, and we look at it across frequencies, it's going to tell us there's a frequency here, a frequency there, and a frequency there. So that tells us the frequencies that are inside this signal. Who is 100% with me right now? Yes. All right, great. What? What is this? What? Non-zero mean? Uh, the non it would be. The non-zero mean would be like at zero hertz. So if there's a value at zero hertz that's not zero, you know the system has to have a non, the, the signal has a non-zero mean because it has a zero hertz component. This is what they're showing here is it's just noise. And if you look at if you look at an FFT, it has it has noise. It usually looks something like that. It's kind of furry on the bottom. Anybody know? Like, yeah. I just have a question. What is the y-axis of the frequency axis slash domain? Power. Same. Power. It's in like dB per hertz right. typically. The y, I'm sort of avoiding talking about the y-axis value because it's, it doesn't. Add a ton because they're usually assessed like relatively, and it's sort of a confusing set of. It's easier to talk about in the context of convolution, which we're not going to go over. So, what if I let's say I had a step, and I said, "What's the frequencies in a step?" Anybody have any idea? Like, what would this show? If I said, "I'll draw it in red," what I want to say. So I want to analyze this signal. How many, like, what do you know? Any thoughts on the frequency content of that signal? It's just a step. Yeah. Just like one bar, like one frequency? One frequency would look like this. Oh, oh it's flat. Across, right, like, so that would be one frequency. So like we wanted the question is sort of like what are the frequencies that make up a step function? Does it have high frequency components? Do you know the, how do you know it does? Because it has a really sharp increase. It has a really sharp increase. 
And so what do you know about slow, low frequency signals? They don't rise sharply, certainly not with infinite slope. So because it has sharp corners, you automatically know it's got high frequency components. If we were to take the Fourier transform of that step signal, it would look something like this. We would have like power hot at low frequencies, and then you would still see some components of high frequencies that would just trail off. You with me on that? Okay, cool. Good. This was some data that we talked about. I kind of showed you this. This was IMU, IMU data. We talked about the frequency in it. Right, it's sharp and jagged looking. And if we filter it, it looks something like that. What's all this? What is all this? It's a blue. Noise. I would say it's definitely some noise, but it's also some signal. It's also like signal in there, seeing an impact. It's going to have some high frequency components. So we're seeing some noise, but some signal. And we're just these, everything that's in blue that you don't see in red, that's what's removed when we did that filter. So when we reassemble that, does it make sense that if I say we can reassemble the time domain from the frequency domain, if we reassemble the red here, we reassemble the blue there, and we can see all of this frequency information, this is all what's kind of in the components that are not in the red. So anyways, hopefully you can kind of look, love for you guys to be able to kind of look at this information, deduce certain aspects of your system, what freq like where is the signal in terms of frequency, what do I want to remove, or or keep what's, what frequencies exist in this system or response, and how can you filter it or, or change it in a way that makes your like, robot more successful. OK. We talked about kind of like these three different types of filters. And this was kind of like introducing that we can think about filters as a multiplication in the frequency domain. So if we have a system. We have our signal, we multiply it by a frequency domain signal, take those products, that gives us the frequency content of the output. So something that was just one across all frequencies does nothing. Something that's two will amplify the system by two, and if we start to make that, drop that off, we start to remove frequencies. We learned low pass, band pass, and high pass. Is it clear that when I say the multiplication, I'm talking about multiplying the signal's frequency content by a shape that looks like one of these? That's weird. Someone trying to connect to this? <laughs> about is those multiplying these red lines. I'm thinking about that. <coughs> Yay. Okay. So when I say multiplication, we're multiplying something like that blue signal in the frequency domain that looked like kind of fuzzy. We're going to multiply it by one of these shapes. When we multiply it by one of those shapes, it's going to allow the frequencies where this multiplication factor is one to still come through, and it's going to attenuate anywhere where it's not one. And then when we reassemble those frequencies into that signal in the time domain, we've then removed all the frequencies where it's not one. Does that make sense? OK, good. We talked about how do you choose your cutoff frequency. And this is kind of an art and science. This has to do with understanding what it is you're trying to do, what are, what's in your signal, what system are you analyzing. So there's not really a right answer to this. It really comes from looking at your data. You would look at the frequency content of your data. Try to like ascertain what of that is signal, what of that is noise, adjust your cutoff frequency, and see how your system's performance improves or doesn't. So we kind of, I had this, this kind of M file we looked at, and you guys have access to that. 
It lets you kind of change the cutoff frequency, really look into how changing the frequency will affect the way the data look. I hope, I hope like you guys spend some time with that. It's good. This was like an example of a filter API that I've created in the past. So you guys got access to this. It's a really just like not complicated filtering function where you would input some things. This is a function called low filt. You put your the sample rate, the order of your filter, the cutoff frequency, and the actual data, and it returns to you the filter data. So there's lots of different versions of functions, both in Python and in Matlab, that do this. What does the order do? Yeah. My order has like steeper cutoff. Steeper cutoff. That's right. So it's this. How steep is that? Does that make sense? If it's higher order, it will be steeper, which means frequencies that are past but close to the cutoff frequency will get attenuated faster. Yeah. So if you have a super high order, and let's say the frequency is like 10 that you're trying to cut off, if it's super high, then like 9 would get cut off, but if it's uh, low? You know, it would be like 10.5 will get cut off. Oh, okay. And then, yeah. but if it's super low, then like 10.5 would be accepted in? It, it will still, it will be attenuated, but its rate of attenuation is less. So there'll be more of 10.5 or 11 hertz in a lower order filter than there will be in a higher order filter. I usually use two or three order, second or third order. For, it works well. It's really common to have like the way these these filtering functions work is to have it like return to you filter coefficients. So that's kind of what, what's happening here. It's using a function called butter. What does butter do? What is butter? Like, what's happening there? Yeah. Doesn't it smooth it out? Butter is a specific. Butter is what this is returning to you is a set of coefficients that define the filter. <coughs> Filters can be can be defined all sorts of ways. Butterworth is a specific shape of this curve, that red shape. So butter is a specific shape. There's lots of shapes, vessel filters. Yeah. Does higher order mean more coefficients from butter, or it's always two? No, it would be more coefficients. So like these are vectors. Oh. Okay. Yeah, the factors that define the coefficients. It's usually done in that way where it returns to you two vectors. So these are sophisticated functions for filtering. What are what's another way to filter that's maybe not so sophisticated? A little bit easier to implement. Also something we learned. Yes. Basic cutoff function. What I'm going for here is moving average. <laughs> so a moving average filter is a low pass filter, agreed? It's gonna have, it just has a, its own shape. Instead of Butterworth, it's gonna look a little different, but it's still gonna filter. So we're gonna allow the low frequencies to, to pass through. So this is explaining kind of the, uh, a moving average where all we do is keep the last kind of X number of samples, always average those. So that's what this function finds. It's easy. The only thing you have to do is do a little bookkeeping with your variables to make sure you're tracking and transitioning them uh, each loop. Does that make sense? Who does, who does that? Who's not tracking that? You guys are all tracking this. Great. OK. Now we're talking about steering control. So that's it on filtering. So you've done filtering in MATLAB and in Python. You have examples from us. It's useful and important in controlling your ball bot. Trying to think of other things you might want to filter. Well, we'll come back to it. Okay, so let's talk about steering control. This, you guys, you, know, you guys have learned that that's this is kind of how we're setting things up. We have a balance controller. You guys have all done that, and you guys are balance controllers are working well. Now, what I'm going to talk about is adding to this balance controller so that it both steers and balances. Okay, 
So there are many different ways to make this ball bot steer. And we've kind of alluded to a few of them in class. But in fact, I don't know that there's really a right answer to this, like how should it steer? It's just a way that works is all we want. <laughs> a steering method that works. And I wasn't sure we were gonna get this. In fact, I was planning that we weren't gonna be able to make it steer. We have a controller that's beginning now to make it steer. That's what I'm gonna teach you today. Um, before we kind of talk about exactly the way we did it, I just want to talk through a few different options. If we wanted to steer, what are some things, some variables that we could use to build a steering controller? What do you have access to? Yeah. Yeah. Control lean angle, which means you could map your your joysticks to changing that lean angle, and, and that would potentially let it steer. Definitely, that was the first thing we tried. Yeah. So then, and how would that work? Um, what we have is we by moving the stick, it increases the torque of like the motors that would make it move on the y-axis and the x-axis. So, so you take works. you take your joystick. Yeah. You map that in your two planes, and you use that as like a what we say is a feed forward torque, where you're adding a torque in a direction. So that's another that's another option. So this would say, this would be like add torques directly. That's and that I would say is not there's no feedback there. So that's a little bit that's a different approach in the sense that it's not going to use feedback to do to do steering. You're just giving it a feed forward, apply a torque, and then it has to apply that torque in balance. And that, that, we've tried that too, that could work. Yep. Velocity of the ball. Velocity of the ball. How does that work? Um, using the motors, you can calculate how fast the ball is actually moving forward. And then you can say, like, I want to be going one radian per second in mm -hmm. any direction. Yes. So that's another option is to control, is to look at the ball's velocity and use that as a mechanism of control. That's what we did. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, there's one more. One more option. You guys said one that I didn't have written down, so I'm going to do this one. There's one more way that I think if we want to make this thing steer, we've talked about its lean angle, we've talked about adding torques directly, we can control the velocity of the ball potentially. One other thing we could put, or like one other class that we could potentially create a controller around. What about its like XY position? We could say, like, one another option would be to have it try to follow a position on the floor. So an x, y position. So instead of, of a ball velocity, it would be a ball position. So I'll say position of the ball. All of these are, are good ideas and potentially viable control strategies. Because of this system, which has a certain amount of inertia, a certain amount of torque, certain amount of like reflected properties, we can't, like we couldn't get all of these to work even though they're all good ideas. The only one that we got to work is that one. The rest of them, we can get it to kind of, it kind of work, but you, but you can always make it crash. It's like a fighter jet, sort of. Do you guys ever heard that like fighter jets are are, have this trade-off where on one hand they're incredibly unstable and that's by design. They're designed to be incredibly unstable so that they can be agile. The closer they are to instability, the faster they can respond and be agile. That's something like what we have here. This system can only respond like so quickly and with so much agility. We have this kind of trade-off between the agility of the system and how stable it is. So those of you that are, you will, you will kind of make this trade as you develop and tune these controllers. You can make it slow and more stable or more agile and less stable. And that's a trade-off. That's kind of common in this in engineering. Okay, I want to just reorient you. We're gonna look at some block diagrams. This is a block diagram you've seen before. So it's gonna, we're gonna kind of build on this, but before we do that, I wanna make sure everybody tracks this diagram. Like exactly what that's saying. Like could you could hopefully take this picture and create a, a Python script from it. 
That's what I would, that's what I would hope. You have that level of understanding that this is a, the instructions for a Python script. You guys good with this? Okay, so we just what we're looking at here is some loops. And this every time the controller makes an iteration, it kind of runs this set of calculations. And it does that continuously at 200 hertz. Okay. So, this here, what we want to do is monitor the ball's velocity. Build a controller that monitors the ball velocity. Who's looked at the ball? Has anybody looked at the ball velocity signal? What does it look like? Um, ours, I believe, is kind of noisy. Pretty noisy, yeah. And why do you, where's that noise coming from? Uh, I just got to it last night, so. <laughs> it comes from this taking this derivative. So we're, so yeah, like when you, when we're calculating the ball's velocity, we have to do a numerical differentiation. That's gonna add a ton of noise already by itself. So we know the ball's velocity from the motor encoders and numerical differentiation. So that brought, brings us here. So now what we're seeing is every control loop applies some effort to the ball bot. Let's think about what the ball bot's sending out. This is the system's actual the system is being operated on, it's going to move and change. We're going to measure that, so with what it's measuring. We're measuring its actual lean angles via the IMU. We're measuring its actual uh, wheel rotation speed. We're going to take the derivative of that wheel rotation. We're going to have V dot. And now we're going to compare that to a velocity reference. When we compare that to a velocity reference, we're going to get some error. We're going to output that error and sum it. And then we have a balance controller that's always balancing and a steering, or and a steering controller that's looking at velocity. This is the two parallel PID loops that we've kind of been talking about. So we said we're going to have two sets of, P of PID loops, one doing balancing, one doing steering. This is what it is. How many PID loops are on the screen there? If you break up the X and Y planes. There should be four. Yeah, four. Because you're, yes. you're right, you have to break them both up. So now another thing that's changed in the way that you're looking at this block diagram is that now the wires contain two values, just to make it a little cleaner. In this previous version, Every wire is just, well, these wires are meant to be operating on a single value. Now, to streamline that, I sort of condensed it. They're operating on two values, but it's the same thing. So each one of these wires now contains two values. OK, both loops now, this is what I'm saying, now represent both planes together. Yeah. I was just curious, since like on the last one, like we know that we knew that the Jacobian was messed up for getting the velocity. Has it been changed again since then, or is it still what we had? We there was a Jacobian update after that after like the that homework problem, and that's the only update. It should be good. So this is one PID loop. This is another PID loop. This reference is a balance controller. This reference stays. At upright. Now we're looking at references in both planes, x, z, and y, z. Stay upright. Now we want to follow a velocity. So we should have a velocity reference. What would happen if that, let's just say for now, that velocity reference is zero? What's it going to do? And like, what would happen? How would this controller implemented with a velocity reference of zero change the, the stability controller that you guys have been looking at for the last kind of week or two? What, like what would happen? What would be different? Yeah. What I experienced when I had it is that it causes some jittering because the 
stability controller wants to change the velocity because it wants to, like if it's leaning to the right, it wants to lean to the left, but then the velocity reference, like I don't want to lean to the left, it's going to equally cancel it out and it won't be able to balance. I think that that is possible. What you're saying there is basically like they're not cooperating and it is possible for them to not cooperate. But I would say that's a risk. What I would imagine, what I would hope, so as you guys have seen in your balance controllers, it doesn't care if it's moving. It only cares if it's balanced. So once it's once your system is your balance controller only is is operating, if it starts to roll, so it leans, then it corrects, but it's rolling. It doesn't mind. It's happy to be rolling at an arbitrary velocity in any direction as long as it's on top. That's that's a kind of a risky way to do it. We want more control over it. We don't want it. We want it to be discouraged from being balanced and maintaining a large velocity. Does that make sense, what I'm saying there? So what this would do is then balance this idea of you have to balance the ball about on top of the basketball, but also you have to maintain a low velocity. So it's going to keep it from balancing and kind of rolling around. And that actually it works pretty well. This was maybe the first clue we got that this can actually likely steer it, is that we started to see it started to slow the system down. And that's always been the problem. This problem the entire class has been that once the ball gets rolling fast, we can't stop it. It doesn't have a torque to stop it. So this was actually, for the first time, we were seeing the ball bot stop. So that means if we can stop it, then we can make it roll a little bit and stop. But what I really want you to, this is like, this is the controller. I really want you guys to be tracking this diagram. So if there's other, we want to walk through it again or something, we can, but we're going to kind of build on this for the next few slides. So like, how did you get it to, because like, like when I had it and I wanted the zero, like it perfectly canceled out the balance, where like all, it, all my bot would do is just perfectly jitter and then just fall off. Well, I'm not sure. But I, this makes sense to me that this would work, because it's able to balance. Like when it's balancing as is, pre, before we added the steering controller like this, it just wouldn't, it had a dimension or, of, or a degree of freedom that we didn't care about. Or had no effect on, but actually really cared about. We don't. We didn't want it to be able to balance and roll fast. That's just a, a byproduct of the fact that we're only worried about the ball on top, the, the uh, chassis on top of the ball. So if it, it doesn't care if it has velocity, it's just as happy to be rolling at infinite speed or stationary as long as the ball is the chassis is on top of the ball. So this stops that. This makes it so. It doesn't, it discourages the ball from having a high velocity. Does that make sense? So the reason, I guess, the reason why I think that this is a promising control strategy is because we had a challenge, which was it had, we didn't have any constraint on velocity, and we were seeing that have an effect. It would be that it would balance, but it would also roll kind of wildly around, and we didn't like that. So can we add something that should allow the system to maintain its original behavior, but addresses this degree of freedom? And that's what I think this controller does. That's why it seems promising to me. It doesn't, there's no cost because the balance controller doesn't care what its velocity is. And then I wanted to show, this is the same, this is the same diagram, just sketched by center. So like what I, reason why I wanted, you to, sh I wanted to show this to you is because it just looks a little different. But it's the same thing. And it might be easier for you just to see what we're trying to talk about in this picture versus mine, and also show you that like, people describe things a little differently. Do you guys see that this is the same? Does this look like the same thing to you? We have two parallel PID loops. Velocity controller is looking for a velocity reference, so that's gonna be phi dot x and phi dot y, and then the balance controller is looking for a body set point reference. Yeah. Um, I remember you mentioned uh, you were trying to like you were testing two different ways of trying to get it to steer, whether it was actually just moving or like spinning Z and then going forward. Yeah. Forward. Was which one did you guys end up doing? Right now it only controls down one direction. So right now we're still we're doing the rotate and steer. Okay. But I don't know that that's what I think it could be implemented either. I don't know that that's really helping us to do that. It's just a choice. Do you think it's helping to do that? Do either way because we have. Yeah, so that's kind of more, the decision there would be more about like, what do you think is more convenient to control? What will you be better at controlling? Okay. So 
So this shows a little bit of how these concepts can be represented similarly. And then this is, this lets them operate together and, I, and ideally like operate together in such a way that it addresses a challenge that we had. Do we need to be concerned about the balance controller being overpowered? Yes. Yes, we do need to, to be concerned about that. What will that cause? It'll fall over. It's going to lose balance. So we do, we do need to think about, hey, we have these two controllers. They're operating in parallel together. What happens if one overpowers the other? Particularly, the, we don't want the balance of the board to be overpowered. If it falls over, like, all is lost. So let's think about how we can combine about how we combine these storks. So what we're going to kind of do now is learn some like I will say is like bells and whistles, some attributes we added to this controller that help it function and be successful. The actual controller like it's just this. So it's just these two loops. Now we're going to learn like some modifications of these loops that help. But the core content of the control is really just these two loops. What can we do to prevent the balance controller from being overpowered? This is sort of review. These, what do these block diagrams say? You guys, can you answer that? What are these block diagrams saying? It's describing getting the values and then putting it into the PID and then how it's going to go back to the robot. Yeah. yeah. Yep. If I had to say at the highest level, I'm going to say balance while, while maintaining the velocity. So both maintain a velocity and balance and do both of those. How exactly this work or how, what will this do? It really is going to depend on the reference, on the velocity reference. But the idea is it'll keep it from rolling away. So this is something I was gonna I wanted to do to kind of see if you guys can create one of these block diagrams, which is create a version of this block diagram that operates on the position of the ball. I think, I, I think we should do that. I think we should take 15 minutes or so. What I'm looking for you to do is create something that looks like this, 10 minutes maybe. I want you to create something that looks like this, where what your drawing is, how we would execute this if we wanted to maintain the position, not the velocity. And I'm gonna draw this here. So I want you to recreate either this diagram or this diagram, whichever one you think is makes more sense to you. Recreate it, but include not the velocity component. We're not controlling velocity, but control the position of the ball in the XY plane. Now, memory I want to make sure you guys are like tracking the, like the architecture of these controllers. Try not to try to base it as much on your own knowledge as possible. It wasn't like pattern matching the notes, try to like really track. This is the control loop, this is trying to control position and balance.
Which is probably so, better than painting uh, and painting it. Right. I should be fit because for car carpets available. There's an extra slide on the, like if you're looking at the slides, this slide is blank. If you want to draw there. We do, but it's pretty funny. Uh, when you're finished, walk us through the, your version. Great souls. You, can we come sketch it on the one of here? Are you done? You, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Three women's size shirts up here that are actually women's size shirts. So if you ordered them, they came <laughs> separately and they're up here. Should I bring back the other one? Probably, I mean, I, so we, we just ordered enough for the class, so like there shouldn't really be any extras. So if you have them and we have these, that means somebody shouldn't have a shirt, but it seemed like everybody got the shirts. So I'm confused. Like the number of shirts last time. And they I think maybe they sent us regular shirts instead of the you know, size, and then they realized it and sent us these afterwards. And so now we have a few extra. So I'd say 
It doesn't matter to me what happens to those other ones. <laughs> whatever, whatever you guys want to do with them. Well, these, you know, somebody should take these because I don't, I mean, there's nothing I can do with these. <laughs> Organization is terrible. <laughs> All right. I'm not sure how to figure it out. It's all of it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, so I'm going to like talk through it. Great job. Thank you for drawing this, coming up here and doing it. Is everybody everybody created their their version of this? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this look like generally right. There's a few things a few things I want to kind of point out and see where you guys landed. Um, as of as it is right now, we don't. Uh, there's no addition of the z-axis controller. So as we as for as we talk about balance and steering, or the z-axis aspect still works, but I mean, for the sake of clarity of these diagrams, it's not going to be in there. So given that, does this have a z-axis component? No. So these would actually only output two torques that will be, they'll get converted to three uh, when you do the torque conversion, which would sort of sit right here. Like here, there would be a block that converts it from uh, x, y, z to like three and then sends it. And that would be basically the only addition. And then instead of determine, this is reference yeah, yeah I meant to say like ideal position. The reference position. So that's right. So we get the information from the ball bot. We're going to get motor encoder data, take that motor encoder data, convert it to XY position of the ball. So we would have to know ball radius to convert rotation of the ball into its XY movement. But yeah, this is it. So you would have some understanding of, of its XY position and how that's changing, and you would feed that back. So if it was trying, it would feed that back in these planes, and it would try to maintain a position. So what would happen if it, let's say I had it balancing right here, and I'm saying just maintain your position right here while you balance, and I drag it over here. What should it do? It should like slowly bounce, it's kind of bring itself back. That's a little bit, that's good, that would be challenging because the, the torque that it would need to bring itself back is enough that it would potentially destabilize it. So it might work. But we haven't gotten this position control to work. Mostly I just wanted you to understand how to build this type of controller and what you might do if you had it. So the goal kind of for like right now is for you to be able to understand how what you have access to from a measurement perspective, what you know from a task objectives perspective, how to combine that in a block diagram that looks something like this. And then the next step would be, can you take this and convert it into Python code. That we have done for you, but I would want I would want you to think that you could do that. Like that that's not out of reach. It just for the sake of time, you'll know, make you guys do that. There'll be a lot of, of debugging in that process. But you could do that. Like this is all like straight, pretty straightforward math operations. Awesome. Great job. Okay. Now I want to go through a few like what we call I'm calling like helpful tips. I was going to call them best practices, but I felt like when I called them best practices, it made it seem like you should always do it. And that's not true. So everything I've told you is basically that has a term best practice is really like a helpful tip, which means it may not always be appropriate. So these are helpful tips. OK. We're going to learn a few things to help the system balance. We were talking before, we want to make sure we can limit the steering controller so it can't overpower the balance controller and crash itself. So 
So to this end, this is what we're going to do. We're going to not allow the, the steering controller to add more than 40%. of the max duty cycle for torque. So we're going to make sure, we're going to saturate the steering controller so it can never add more than the balance controller. The max that it could ever add is 40% of the total effort, 40% of the maximum effort. Both torques, so this means both torques, balance, and steering can saturate. The way I want to kind of like show that is here. So now we're zoomed in. We're zoomed in in this area of the block diagram, which is where the two controllers are being summed. So this is the, the PID loops are kind of the summing blocks that have the negative signs. And the one with the two positive signs is where we're adding the two Controllers, so we're going to add something there. We're going to add something that looks like this. <laughs> These are saturation blocks. These are like these are saturation blocks that will just cap it at either forty percent or sixty percent of the maximum duty cycle. Does that you understand? The clear like, this is saturating it, so it's not going to let it go over forty percent. This is saturating it, not going to let it go over sixty percent. We've now like made sure that the balance controller will always win. Does that make sense? That's the like, mm -hmm. tips and tricks. Yeah. To find that like saturation limit, was it just like trial and error to see when it overpowered it? Yeah, I would say I would say it was more like the general understanding that we don't we want the balance controller to, to leave. So the exact percentages probably aren't crucial. Like as long as it's generally this format. If it was 70-30, that may or may not work, but it's it probably doesn't have to be like exactly 0.416. It might work at 70-30, I don't know. Have you tried that? Yeah, we have tried it. Uh, but this is the idea here is we've now made sure our steering controller will not overpower a balance controller. This helps make the system more stable. How did we know to do this? Yeah. The fact that I guess you saw the two controllers fighting each other and then it losing balance a lot easier than before. Yeah, so now like, you have some observations you, you maybe you're watching it and you can tell that it can get into a place where it's that's tricky. You might the controllers are competing. And it also like if you think about it, you might it might occur to you that okay, like yeah, we the balance controller, like we need it to balance, that's a higher priority. So we figure out some way to make sure it stays like that. This just this what I'm trying to say here is like I wouldn't call this a hack, but this is like a a tip and trick that we that correct a problem that we observe or could have thought of. And there this kind of thing exists like all over robotics. Like there are lots of things you might observe when you're developing a system and you might it might occur to you, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this with this type of tool and then it might work. So like that's total this is the kind of thing that's totally normal in the development of robots. Like there might be versions of this that are different that you might have to add in future applications that would be totally fine. Okay, another, so that was kind of one first tip and trick, saturating to make sure the balance controller always leads. Second thing that we're gonna talk about is something called a dead band. So we will also find it helpful to add a dead band to the velocity controller. What's a dead band? Yeah. The signal's too low, it'll just cut it off, set it to zero. <clears throat> yes. 
a dead band tells the controller to do nothing. The error is sufficiently close to zero, which is, I think, exactly what you're saying. So we're going to take an error. We could talk about this in terms of the output reference, or we could talk about it in terms of the error. So I'm going to talk about it in terms of the error, which is, OK, if the error is low, don't do anything. There needs to be a sufficient amount of error in the controller for it to operate. So that just means, so now imagine its velocity is like close to zero. You, say you, want to, you want it to stay at zero. It's close to zero, but it's kind of oscillating around zero. You don't necessarily want it. If its velocity is low, that means it's doing well. And if it's oscillating around zero, it's, pretty, it's probably pretty close to doing what you want it to do. You don't want the velocity controller then to be adding effort. We want to tell it like, OK, no, in that, in that circumstance, don't do anything. It helps avoid oscillations. And it's particularly helpful when you have something like transmission backlash. If there's transmission backlash, there's going to be sort of an area around where, where air is low, where there, things are going to get weird and nonlinear. <coughs> now I want to say like how I'm drawing this. So now we're still, we're zoomed in, or we're zoomed in a little bit higher now. So we're still on this kind of like place where the two loops are coming together. And what I'm saying here is that this is the description of a dead band. So it's essentially a switch. So this is the, con the contribution for the steering controller of our torques. So what we're saying is if theta dot x or theta dot y are below some threshold, or the error is below some threshold, switch. And so this switch switches to zero, and means this, this whole thing now sees at zero. It doesn't see the output of this controller. So this is sort of a logical operation. That would be a switch. Does that make sense? We're looking at it in a block diagram form. In a, what might that look like in software in Python? Very simple if statement. An if statement. Yeah. Do you know the threshold around what? Like. Yeah, so that would be something that is tuned. So that would be something that we have a threshold. Do you know what our threshold is? 0.5 radians per second. 0.5 radians per second. Yeah, so we have around point. <coughs> 0.5 radians per second, that's, that would be tuned like experimentally. So yours will, would probably be something close. So this says switch switches to zero if under certain conditions. Yeah. yeah just to clarify, is it that like the, like the reference, like the velocity that you're trying to track is zero or is it the error? It's the output of the controller. Okay. Oh, the okay. output of the controller, like <clears throat> instead of providing effort, gets forced to providing no effort. Yeah. And now I want to add like a small addition to this. So now we've we've talked about a dead band. We've talked about kind of the balance between the steering controller and the balance controller. Now we want to add another, another kind of catch, which is if your ball bot's leaning, let's say it's leaning hard, it's leaning really far over, do you want the steering controller to be able to add any more torque? No. And then all it's doing is driving itself off the ball. So at some point, we want to say, OK, like the, the ball's getting well, that's getting to a kind of a dangerous leaning position. We want to correct that. So what we're going to do is say do nothing, which lets the balance controller take over. So we also we also want the system to pay attention to its lean angle. If the lean angle is large. Turn steering <coughs> controller off. Okay, so it's leaning. What's a, what's a? Do so you guys know like what's about the maximum lean angle we expect to see? 
Mm -hmm. anybody, anybody have any idea there? Is it like four degrees? About four degrees. So what we want to say is, if our system is leaning up at four degrees, then it's about to be, it's about to crash. It's about to have the, the ball up fall off. And so we want it to do nothing but get back onto its stability. So set the, set the steering controller to zero, let the balance controller take over. How, how could we do that? Yeah. Just add it to the dead band switch. Yeah, so then maybe we want to add a, another logical statement here. And this is essentially the same thing. We want to turn that controller off. So let's add another logical operation to our dead band. Now, if the lean angle is greater than four degrees, steering controller off. So this would now be switches to zero if We want to switch to zero if our velocities are below some threshold, that's the dead band, but we also want it to switch to zero if theta is greater than four degrees. So now it has kind of two logical statements that turn that dead band on. So now it's actually not just a dead band. So I, I like, I'm going to leave it call a dead band for simplicity, but now it's a dead band and doing this other thing, but let's just still call it a dead band. <clears throat> Does that make sense? How we just modified our dead band to now do something else that's really helpful, which is prevent it from driving itself off the ball, off the basketball. These are our, our uh, saturation blocks. <clears throat> Let's add all the components from today together. This is the steering controller. This has been uploaded to Canvas, which we'll talk about in a second. Do you track this control diagram? So what we did here was we added our saturation block from our original controller. You know, that's this add more effort than the steering controller. And then our steering controller takes a velocity reference, looks at a dead band, either sets that controller effort to zero or allows it to control, saturates it at 40%. And that's it. So where, where does this velocity reference come from? How, like now, now maybe, so you have this working and you want to implement it, where's your block, where do you want to get that velocity reference from? Yeah. PS4 controller? PS4 controller. So we want to take that PS4 controller, we want to map it to a velocity reference. So now you'll have kind of one joystick that maybe does velocity, one that does rotation. The rotation part's not in here. I thought about having that be like an exercise, it'll be like, class exercise to add the, the axis rotation, but it just got too crazy on that, so I didn't need that. <laughs> do you guys feel like you could do this? Do you feel like you could implement this? Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. For like the saturation, like the interface we're using we don't really like have, or maybe we do, and I don't realize it. We don't have like direct access to like the duty cycle. You don't. So like, when we're doing that saturation, we should figure out like some max torque and use, and then like work backwards from there to figure out how to set those limits. Yeah, that's a good question. Sent there, you have to answer that one. 
Um, so they don't, yeah, they don't have access to it. So is it converted into, is it all done in Torque? Yeah, so even the pain and duty cycle is still a duty cycle. It's not a torque, right? So they can just saturate the plane and torques, which then correspond to the motor torques yeah. before the transformation. So you could just saturate plane and torques instead of motor torques. But what, this, but what is that saturation level? If it, I got that is, if it's duty cycle, it's very clearly 0 0.4, 0 0.6. But if it's in the torque world, <coughs> it's still a duty cycle, right? The plane are Torques are still duty cycles, which then convert gets converted into motor duty cycles. Okay, that's. I mean, I'm, that sounds right, but I think they're. I would say they're torques, not duty cycles, but maybe. But they're they're not in like they're in torque like units though. Yeah, but so we wouldn't know what exact value. We like we have to do something to find where the. Yeah, so comes. your max planar duty cycle would be somewhere around 0 0.8, which corresponds to each okay. motor's max. Motor duty cycle. Yeah, but I think so. Like you guys have no, you guys have never used duty cycle. You guys have only used torque. So like that's this is written as a duty cycle, but the value, unless it's one to one, there's that value would change, and it's not exactly clear, clear to me what that value would be. Well, except like in the code, we're limited by 0 0.8. Like I think that's what he's saying. Like we're limited by that 0 0.8. So like 0.4 of the 0 0.8. Yeah. yeah. So that would that would convert it. Cool, but it's implemented in the code we're going to give you. Um, so if you do this and you map your controller to this velocity set point, you should be able to sort of crudely make it roll and maybe even make it roll really well. So that would be kind of what you are going to work on on Tuesday and Wednesday if you choose to. Now you have, you have two classes and whatever time you invest, how you like allocate your time to the different aspects that will be judged in the competition is kind of up to you guys. But you have, you, I think you could easily implement the steering controller if you wanted to, if everything else was ready. Yeah. What exactly is being judged in the competition again? You'll have to watch the, watch the beginning of the lecture. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. Go, yeah, no worries, we go over it, but it's like, it's four tasks. Okay, cool. Basically like two balance, one rotation, one, one steering. Okay, so I want to just show you for a second like on Canvas. Uh, this file has been uploaded, so it's Rob 311 steering demo. So this is, can be downloaded and used, but you'll have to tune it for your application. But otherwise, it should do all the things that we want. So it's under lab or uh, lecture 24 on Canvas. How many PIDs are there? Okay, so then like the last thing I want to say basically is this slide. So it's like this is everything we learned in this class. So over the entire semester, you kind of learned this process. We learned kind of like specking, how to make the decisions up front, how to, how to locate and create uh, a layout for different program applications. There's been a few different ones. Obviously, it involved a lot, a lot. We did three modeling, file generation, manufacturing, sensing, communication, the whole thing. Do you guys feel like, do you feel like these are all check marks? Sweet. If you do, then I would say you feel like, I think that you have learned how to build robots and make them move. And I hope that this class, in addition to providing a, like a deep dive on one rather sophisticated robot, the ball bot, the hope is, is that it gives you a kind of a foundation that you can use to build robots in the future. That's kind of the game. Another thing that I think is, so you guys eventually will get all your ball bot stuff back. We're gonna need all your components. You'll put them back and give back after this is all over. If you wanted to keep the, the driver board so that you could make other robots with it in the future, you can. But the deal is, you have to actually make other robots with it. But if you want to, you can have it. So keep or like think about how you want how you want to handle that. If you don't want it, that's fine. We'll take them back and reuse them. And what I would love to see is this class like enable students to build robots, and then I start to see robots around campus around FRB. 
So that's that's what I'm trying to do is get you guys some access to those boards since a lot of those stuff we learned was kind of contingent on those boards. Any questions? We have a couple of minutes. You want to go back over the competition? For those of you that are here. Okay, we have like two minutes. So let me just read you the read, read, talk over the competition. Okay. Final competition next Thursday. There's gonna be four tasks. You're gonna be graded on how well you can do these tasks. There'll be like scores, we'll have like a leaderboard. If you beat, we'll, we, the center and I will also compete. If you beat us, you get an automatic A on the project. Uh, there's four tasks, 10 minutes of balancing, that's the last ball bot standing, or whatever, not <coughs> really standing after 10 minutes. Two minutes to find your maximum uh, z-axis angular velocity without toppling over, so we'll do that by doing a two minute trial, and take, saving your data and analyzing it. We'll enter your maximum velocities in our like, little leaderboard application. And then we're going to do two minutes of balancing on a surface that, that is shaking. So that's kind of a perturbation-based balance test. And then the last thing is you have to steer around a four foot by four foot square loop. And you get points for how many sides you get around that loop. Yeah? Um, can we have different scripts for each, for each one? Definitely. Right? Are you guys cool with that? I think that seems fine. Okay. Yeah? Um, for the balancing, like if one robot runs into another robot, does that DQ the other robot? <laughs> 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 no, no, no. We'll That's a good question. We'll spread out. We're gonna we're gonna do this in the atrium. We'll get a bunch of all the tables out of the way. We'll spread out. Hopefully they won't contact each other. Velocity <laughs> 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 controller. Sometimes the other teams. Will we choose a maximum velocity for our robot? And see how long that works, and then whoever chooses the highest one, work or well, just all you have to do is maximum angular velocity in two minutes without falling over. And however you want to do that is is your call. Would you have to hold for two minutes spinning? No. Or okay, you have to achieve it. Yeah, we're gonna do find the velocity maximum in two minutes. That's it. And whatever that number is, that's your score. Like that will be your. Uh, so your we have a two minute time frame to try to get it to spin as fast as we can. But we have to stay on top of it for the entire two minute duration though. How, you have to stay with it? Like the robot has to stay on top of the ball for the two minutes. Yeah. Like for example, you can't just like spin it really fast and record that velocity and later in no, the two minute. Uh, DQ'd. But can you come back down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, all we want is two minutes like you're just going to take two minutes of data, or take your maximum angular velocity. If you didn't fall over, like that's your that's, that was your score or whatever. Makes sense. Yeah. Also for the driving task, like could we automate it, or do we have to like manually drive it? Yeah, I think. I mean, you can try to automate it, but I think that will be hard. Yeah, I think it would be, but. Maybe you can try if you want to. It's your call. Any, however you want to do it. <laughs> Um, there's one other thing. Oh, uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to make sure I said for those of you that were here in the beginning is the reports, the Friday reports will be due when the final, the day of the final. So you have the, till the 19th. Our final on the 19th, there is no final, but that gives you until then to, to turn in your report. You just submit it on Canvas, something Yeah, I'll create an assignment, you'll submit it on Canvas. So by that time, everything will, that'll be the last thing that, that gets turned in. Are, are you going to give any more logistics on that like next week? Like the report? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to give, an, there'll be like an assignment posted, just like a homework, but it'll be about the report. When will that be posted, do you know? Mm, hopefully like next couple of days, hopefully by the end of this week. But you still have, so you have till the 19th. Cool. All right, everybody. I will see you on Tuesday in the lab room. Controller.